Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, this is Gudis Barkan from Loyola University Chicago. I'm the president of the American Society of Cytopathology and I'm thrilled to introduce our guest here today, who is Dr. Viju Padmanabhan. She's a professor of pathology and immunology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Missouri. She's been there since January 2021, and she's the Director of Cytopathology and the Safety and Quality Officer for Anatomic Pathology. Prior to that, she's been at Baylor College of Medicine and Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. Uh, actually, in Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, she did a MPH at the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice in Hanover, New Hampshire with a focus on quality improvement. So she is our quality improvement expert. Now she has membership to um, our society as well as others and has sat in and served as uh, a committee member in various ASC uh, uh, membership uh, committees. And uh, furthermore, she's actually an artist. Uh, she has beautiful paintings and she is the founder of Hutke Design. And uh, without further ado, here is Dr. Padmanabhan, and let's learn about quality. Oh, thank you so much, Guliz. That was such a lovely introduction. Uh, afternoon, folks, uh, wherever you're joining in from. So I'm going to be talking about quality control, assurance, and improvement. Um, so uh, m the objectives of my talk, the first thing I'm going to give you is a little bit of historic perspective on quality in cytology. You know, a little bit about QC and QA, but the bulk of this talk is going to be covering quality improvement, you know, how to do a basic quality improvement project. You know, it's basically a, a small simulation from how to use basic tools, how, you know, learn a little bit about QA data collection and measurement, summarize a QI project, and talk a little bit about barriers to change. So historic perspective, uh, prior to 1967, most laboratories were pretty much unregulated. There was a little bit about interstate commerce, uh, but for the most part, most clinical labs, uh, you know, really didn't have very major standards like we have today. But something changed in 1987 because the lay press had a lot of articles. And, uh, you know, there were these, um, the Washington Post carried articles about inaccurate readings, a chilling examples involving labs where the PAP tests were false negative in 20 to 40 percent uh, of uh, PAPs were false negative. Uh, you know, people were rushing through screening maybe 200 to 300 slides a day. And, uh, you know, and sometimes these tests were performed by people who really didn't even have lab training. So the Wall Street Journal actually did an expose, and this is Walt Bogdanek, who um, wrote about false negative PAPs, also wrote about lax laboratories and, um, uh, you know, physicians' carelessness, which uh, led to a very high failure rate uh, with uh, cervical cancer screening. Uh, he won the Pulitzer Prize for Specialized Reporting in 1988, and it's sad because it was for his chilling series of reports on faulty testing um, by our labs. So the CDC held two meetings on quality assurance in cytology in 1988. So the, so the clear 88 draft um, uh, happened during the CDC hearings. This actually got signed into law and is now actually a part of law. The proficiency testing portion was added in 2005. So this was signed into public law in 1988. So we we are mandated uh, to follow uh, this law as a laboratory that bills for Medicare and Medicaid uh, patients. So the main thing is uh, establishing uniform quality standards, regardless of where the test is performed. The result has to be accurate, reliable, and timely, which is important. And CLIA also said that every lab must establish and follow written policies and procedures uh, for a very comprehensive uh, a QA program, quality assurance program, that is designed to monitor and evaluate the overall testing process. So um, 
you know, we uh, we must have a CLIA certificate. Now, CLIA has, um, uh, you know, there are two accrediting agencies which have uh, been given deemed status by CLIA. One is the Joint Commission or the C, and the other one is the CAP. So your lab could be, you know, uh, accredited by either of these um, uh, agencies because both of them are uh, uh, holding up the CLIA standards. Now, quality, how do you define quality? It's getting the right result the first time and every time. It's truly impossible when it's good because nobody is going to come and give you a pat on the back for that, you know, brilliantly done diagnostic work that you've done. But this is truly impossible to ignore if bad. Uh, one definition based on the Society of Hospital Medicine is meeting the needs and exceeding the expectations of those we serve, delivering all and only the care that the patient needs. The most important thing with quality is consistency. Your test result needs to be accurate and it needs to be precise. So when you're talking accuracy, it's the degree to which the test result actually conforms to the gold standard. Now, you might you know, think that histology or colposcopy may not be true gold standards, maybe pyrite, but you know, that's where we are. The other thing is your test result needs to be precise. Now, if uh, somebody else reads a result and somebody and I read the same result, we need to be in agreement. Um, so quality control is actually a system for verifying and maintaining a desired level of quality in an individual test or process. Quality assurance, on the other hand, is systematic monitoring of quality control results and quality practice parameters so that you can assure you can be assured that all systems are functioning in a manner which is appropriate to excellence in healthcare delivery. So there are some things in uh, cytology, especially in the world of PAP tests, which is mandated quality control by CLIA 88. One of them is a minimum of 10% of our NILM cases, negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy, have to be rescreened. Uh, the other one is a five-year retrospective review of any case that, you know, you today you diagnose as, as HCL or higher. Um, the third is a cytohistocorrelation. And of course, you know, the, you know, this is a given, all the re reactive repair, atypical cases, pre-malignant or malignant cases will be signed out by the pathologist. So when you look at rescreening of negative cases, at least 10% uh, interpreted as known by each Cyber technologist has to be rescreened, and this has to be done prospectively. Um, and clearly, the person who screened it initially cannot be the person who's rescreening it. The whole goal is to reduce any type of screening error. And uh, we also need to have a very well defined um, uh, definition of uh, what we consider high risk. Now, you know, some examples of using high risk. Uh, in the mix would be uh, patients with a history of prior history of HCL, prior history of SIN2 on a biopsy, recent or concurrent high risk HPV positive, patient has not had a screening PAP for the past five years or has had a prior unsat PAP or multiple unsat PAPs. These, uh, in addition to, you know, clinical history that's provided by our clinicians. So retrospective review, um, you know, this is to make sure that you know, to uh, pick up for screening as well as interpretive errors, uh, which can happen. So you want to look at, you know, all the PAPs that your lab has screened in the past five years in a patient who has a history of eight or higher. Now, if there are significant discrepancies, for example, you call something high grade today, but the prior PAP, which was initially signed out as negative, actually shows AIS or it shows adenocarcinoma. Now, that is a major discrepancy, right? So in that case, you need to notify your clinician and amend the report. But in, uh, if, if, if you really don't see any major discrepancies, you really don't need to amend the report or do anything. It's more for your internal learning you know, uh, and review purposes. The other thing, of course, is the cytohistocorrelation, where we, um, you know, it, this could be ongoing, it could be a little retrospective. 
we uh, almost all we always compare all the pre-malignant and malignant gynecology reports with subsequent uh, histopath uh, if available. And if it's not available, you call something high grade. You you know you want to write a letter to your clinician wanting to know what happened to this patient. If you if you don't have anything in your institution. Now, quality assurance is an ongoing and comprehensive program which looks at the entire aspect of the operation. So it uh, involves, you have to have a quality goal. Uh, you have to decide whether your quality goal was achieved. And if it is not achieved, you have to have some sort of a corrective action as to, you know, uh, if the goal is not achieved. Now, the whole um, uh, basis is to build confidence in the laboratory. After what happened in 1987-88, we really need, uh, we needed the, la uh, the lab to have uh, a better image and do better, frankly, and also comply with established standards. So this um, system, this is a system which is designed to detect, control, and prevent the occurrence of errors. So it actually offers a higher level of oversight. Uh, it's not just the step, but you're stepping back and looking at the whole process. Now, how do you maintain QA in the lab? You have to continuously monitor the lab performance. And you also, the other thing is to measure against a set set of quality standards, which could be local, national, or international. So, uh, for example, um, you know, we always, uh, you know, get percentages of uh, low grade ASCAs. We get the rates of uh, per cytotech, you know, we, we match it with the labs, um, ASCAs rate or LCL rate or ASCH rate and so on and so forth. Uh, we're constantly monitoring that uh, uh, performance. And the other thing is, you know, we always, anytime you talk to somebody, you know, about a cytolab, you're going to be asked, what's your ASCUS rate? What's your ASCUS cell ratio? So you really want to measure it against national or international standards based on uh, what's uh, in the literature. So the whole process comes under quality assurance. The pre-analytic steps straight from specimen collection, identification, the integrity of the specimen, the test requisition, the analytic process, the entire process of processing, screening, interpretation, and the post-analytic steps, which is, you know, uh, report generation, call, and uh, patient management, the whole thing comes under quality uh, assurance. So, you know, we uh, the lab really must have a written set of instructions uh, which, re, you know, uh, as to how the diagnostic tests are performed and what, you know, uh, you have to give your clinician um, how to collect the specimen, for example. So most labs have a handbook or a web page, you know, they can link, the clinician can link to. Um, you know, almost every uh, lab has either electronic or paper requisitions to order the test. Um, you know, and you have to have some sort of a receipt policy which says that, you know, the specimen was received in the lab and the identifiers, you know, uh, and it was properly identified or whatever your policy, lab policy may be. And we, we maintain these in the laboratory and uh, we also have um, uh, policies for specimen storage, how the specimen gets preserved, how the specimen is to be transported if the specimen needs to come in from outside and so on. Uh, the analytic process is, you know, what we do in the lab, you know, uh, we really want to, for example, you want to prevent cross-contamination. So some people would use a blank slide between cases and have a log of what they found on the blank slides. You know, some, some labs would want to assess cellularity, you know, to stain all the highly cellular fluids separately. Almost every lab would have a separate uh, staining um, set for CSF or do it the first thing in the morning before they start the routine stain, so on and so forth. Um, and we also have, we also almost always use standard terminology. You know, for the pap smear, everybody uses the Bethesda system. For non-gen uh, you know, specimens, we use the uh, negative for malignancy, atypical or indeterminate for malignancy, suspicious for malignancy or positive for malignancy, the four-tier reporting system, which almost all labs use use the Bethesda system for thyroid cytology, uh, pair system for urine cytology, and so on. You know, so we it, it, we really try, uh, most labs use standard terminology for their reporting. 
Now, what happens after you've reported? Uh, you have to have uh, um, you have to ensure that um, the report actually goes into the patient chart. And if there are any critical reports, you know, uh, that need to be your clinician might need to be called on first time diagnosis of cancer. I'm just giving an example. Each each uh, hospital or lab might have a set of uh, criteria on which they would call their clinician, uh, amended reports, so on and so forth. You want to let your clinician know. Now, uh, we thought we were doing really well because now we have quality assurance, we have quality control, and we're all covered by quality. But then the Institute of Medicine came out with a bunch of publications in 1991 to 2001 to 2005 in that range. Um, so, to err is human, uh, actually focused on patient safety and brought to uh, the public's attention that, you know, uh, 44,000 to 98,000 deaths occur each year because of medical errors. The uh, crossing the quality chasm uh, uh, um, called for a fundamental change in how we deliver healthcare. Um, you know, because it's so fragmented, the nature of care that's uh, being delivered. Um, so it's almost like, you know, we have this uh, fragmented system with an, which some people might think of would be a non-system. And uh, the big thing that came out of to err is human is that a lot of these errors could have been prevented. And a lot of them occurred because of faulty systems or processes. Um, that made, you know, somebody fail uh, and failed, and there was a failure in preventing these errors from happening. Um, so between the healthcare we now have and the healthcare we should have is not a gap, but a deep chasm. Now, uh, this uh, crossing the quality chasm focuses on how we can reinvent healthcare uh, to foster innovation and improve delivery of care. The other big one that came out is improving diagnosis in healthcare. Now, at um, at the very least, uh, most people will experience at least one diagnostic error in their lifetime. That is huge. It and and conservative estimates found that about five percent of adults in the United States who seek outpatient care every year will experience a diagnostic error. And diagnostic errors are actually a big part of litigation and malpractice suits and so on. Um, and they, they are 6 to 17% of hospital adverse events. Now, the Institute of Medicine defines medical error as the failure to complete an action as intended or the use of a wrong plan to achieve an aim. Now, you know, if we look at where healthcare is, and a lot of people will say, oh, I, I'm just going to drive, I'm scared of flying. But look at this, the airline industry has actually got its act together. It's now considered a minimal risk as opposed to healthcare, which is up here next to bungee jumping. So um, think about that uh, for a minute. Um, so Doctors do make mistakes, unfortunately, and, you know, it could be misread pap smears, lost lymph nodes, the wrong diagnosis. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's traumatic both for the patient and for the physician who makes the mistake because we're not intending to make that mistake. Um, patients' lymph nodes were lost. And unfortunately, a lot of these things show up in, uh, you know, in the news media as headlines, you know, with big, big, bold letters, breast removed by mistake, paperwork or slip uh, blamed. Um, so mistakes happen. The CAP actually has a very nice uh, uh, blurb, which is about how this physician made a mistake. Uh, he, she, uh, clearly the names are withheld for obvious reasons, uh, he, she made a big mistake, uh, called a breast biopsy positive, the mastectomy came out, the same person read the mastectomy, uh, the patient had already received chemo, but and, and pulled out the prior breast biopsy to review and found that, you know, they, a, a major mistake had been, a grievous mistake had been made. So, I mean, just look at what this person does. This person talks to her, his or her colleagues about it, and they say, oh, I would have never pulled out the prior slide. Now, that is what you don't want happening with quality improvement. 
Um, so, you know, the other other thing that you can see is how do you reduce malpractice risk in pathology? The, ris the reason I'm talking about risk in pathology is because no other field, I can't think of another field where there are as many gray zone diagnoses and subjective interpretations as PATH. And even experts disagree on controversial diagnoses. So think about that. So the consequences of diagnoses is, you know, it carries over with the patient, you know, uh, throughout their lifetime. I'm going to give you a moment to look at this slide and see what Dilbert, he of course has the final word, had to say about uh, medical errors and mix-ups. It seems we had a mix-up with your test results that I'm not dying. We doctors are amazingly smart, but occasionally we make a little error. Well, I understand. By the way, your pap smear was normal. I'll leave you with that. So quality healthcare is the degree to which health services for individuals and populations increases the likelihood of desired health outcomes and are consistent with uh, current professional knowledge. So we've talked about quality control and quality assurance, right? So now let's move on to quality improvement. Uh, the idea is with quality improvement, we don't say, oh, X made the error, or, you know, we're not inspecting and punishing. But we're asking, how did the system fail to protect the worker who was involved in this error? What did the system do wrong? Where, where can we improve? Quality improvement is an intentional change. It's done in a very methodical and systematic way. You may wonder why, because one, improved morale, improved efficiency, satisfaction. Sometimes it just might be the right thing to do. It gives you essential leadership skills, great for publication and scholarly um, uh, work. Uh, the hope is improved patient outcomes, decreased waste, costs, increased value. We'll talk about value in a minute. Uh, and also, it hopefully, will avoid all the payment penalties, medical, legal, media attention, angry patients, and so on and so forth. And now, of course, it's uh, an ACGME requirement also. When you look at value in, you know, in care, the one of the equations given is quality divided by cost. Now, I talked a little bit about quality and errors just to give you an idea of the quality of care you're receiving. Now let's look at healthcare costs. Now, this is from the CMS website. And here you can see we are currently around 18% of the GDP. And the expected projection is by 2028, we're going to be at 20% of the you know, gross domestic product, GDP of the United States. So it, it, it goes in billions and trillions of dollars. So um, low value can be because of overuse of uh, resources, underuse of resources, or just plain misuse of resources. And there are consequences to poor quality. It could be inappropriate action. You know, you overdo things. Uh, you overtreat a patient. You give a wrong treatment or because the diagnosis is wrong or inappropriate action. There's lack of, uh, there's no treatment given because, you know, again, you may have made a mistake. Um, in the diagnosis or delayed action. And, you know, you really don't want to lose credibility as a profession or as a lab. And of course, none of us wants to go, you know, towards uh, any lawyers and legal action. So the Institute of Medicine came up with um, the domains of quality healthcare. What is quality healthcare? It should be safe, it should be timely, it should be effective, efficient, equitable, and patient-centered. The acronym is STEEP, S-T-E-E-E-P. And what does it entail? So the whole idea behind quality improvement is to reduce process variation. Uh, so you really are working to achieve stable and predictable processes. Every process, there's going to be some variation in every process, right? Now, the whole tenet is to reduce variation so that you don't have, your process is in a form that you know, you know, it, it is an, within acceptable form for what you would accept as variation. We'll talk about this in a, bit, in, a, in a little bit. So when you think about processes, both resources and the activities that you do are addressed together so that you get a certain outcome, right? 
Now, before you make any changes, you need to understand um, the structure, the process and outcomes of your own delivery system, your own processes. So um, Don Abedian is uh, considered by many to be one of the founders of contemporary healthcare quality uh, movement. Um, so the structure, process and outcomes or resources, the structure is basically you know, the type of hospital you're working in, the materials you have, your information technology, the, the, the people, the physicians, you know, your staff, you know, whether, how, how adequately staffed or inadequately staffed you may be, all that comes under the resources or the structure. Processes is what is done and how is it done to give rise to measurable change or results, which is output um, and uh, outcome. So when you look at, you know, when you talk about quality improvement to anybody, they're going to say, oh, my lab is X, Y, Z. There are so many um, uh, uh, systems out there. So, you know, you may be a little confused as to what should I do? How do I start? Especially if you're a resident or a fellow and you have to do a QI project, where do you start, right? So um, some of the, you know, systems are like the Toyota production system, the Lean or Lean Six Sigma system, which uses the DMAIC principle, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control, the rapid cycle improvement, or the PDCA and the PDSA cycles, um, four key habits uh, by the Vermont Oxford Network, which is change, evidence-based practice, collaborative learning, and systems thinking, advanced training program of Intermountain Healthcare, microsystems approach, and so on. These are just some of the models for quality improvement that are there. Now, I'm going to talk about the rapid cycle improvement or the PDCA, PDSA, because that's a very quick and easy thing to learn and um, apply. So what would your reactions be when your usually very courteous and professional clinician is understandably upset because he's seeing the patient in clinic and just got the molecular test report on his TTF1 positive adenocarcinoma from the lung that you signed out three or four weeks ago. Report in the molecular thing was like, you know, quantity, there's not enough quantity. He wants to know why, you know, and what can you do? And he's really upset because the previous X number of patients also didn't have enough quantity. You could say not again. I looked like there was a lot of material on that block. What happened? No, no, no. I'm gonna. He'll definitely call my chair. It's not my fault if it's not QNS. I'm fed up with this system. I'm gonna start looking for another job. Hey, come on! I even asked for extra passes. What more can I do? Right? Or you can decide to launch a quality improvement project. So. Let's simulate a quick QI project where you have inadequate cytology um, uh, specimen for molecular testing. And I'll give you some examples of basic QI tools and how we can use them. So the first thing you want to do is secure support and resources from your leaders. This could be your chair. It could be your AP, um, uh, whoever's your AP lab director. Um, you know, because you really need leadership support for something like this. QI is one thing that cannot be done by yourself in a room. You know, you cannot, it's not like writing a paper because it, it, the improvement, it not only involves you, it involves a whole team. You know, your whole CYTO team is going to be involved with this, uh, involved by this. You want to form a multidisciplinary team, ideally. Um, and you also want to write down, have a plan for your proposed project, have a timeline because, you know, this is all stuff that you're going to be doing on the fly and have the names of all the people who um, you may have volunteered or your chair may have volunteered who may have volunteered themselves, um, you know, so that you know exactly what uh, the project is, the timeline and who all are going to be involved doing this. Now, you know, when you think of teams, we really don't think about that too much. You know, you really want to have about three to eight people. And more often than not, you're going to end up with three rather than eight. Um, ideally, you want to have everybody from the impacted groups. Uh, but, you know, um, it would be nice to have people who are familiar with different elements of the core processes. It would be nice to have a multidisciplinary team. For me, it was great to have my clinician sit in on some of our meetings. Uh, importantly, you need to have a team leader because this person is going to keep uh, track of what you're doing and how you're doing it. 
Now, one way to not do this is call a meeting, wait for everybody to show up, and then, you know, who's there, who's not there, what are we going to talk about, begin the discussion, run out of time, blah, blah. No, you don't want to do that. You really have, because this is so time bound and you, you know, we're all so clinched for time. You want a leader, a timekeeper, somebody who's going to record what you're doing and a facilitator. So have a name, agenda uh, with, for each of your meetings and, you know, have a way to disagree constructively and stay on topic because you'll always have this, oh, in my time, we did it this way. Uh, try, you know, Try bringing it back, redirecting attention to bring back to your current issues. List the action items, assign who's responsible for those action items and by when will they deliver. And every meeting, try to have some sort of an evaluation and see what you can do better. So this is the rapid cycle. This was initially a PDSA, PDCA. Initially, this came through Schuert, Schuhart, who uh, then later through Deming. So you, you may hear of this as Deming cycle, Schuhart cycle, um, the model for improvement. Um, uh, Langley, uh, Nolan and Nolan actually formalized this. The you know, aim is what are we trying to accomplish? Measurement, how will we know that the change is an improvement? You need to measure, right? And what change can we make that will result in the improvement? So. Now, change is not guaranteed to lead to an improvement. In our project, the first change we made, it didn't lead to an improvement, actually. So we had to make another change. Um, so every PDSA is a quick cycle. You know, it, you really don't need 100 samples. Even, even 15, 20 samples will help you get off, you know, get on to your PDSA cycles. And it's like, you know, a slope where you're constantly changing, uh, you know, your parameters so that you get the best results. It's basically learning in action uh, and trial and learning. Um, so plan, state your objective, make your pre predictions and be very detailed. What, when, where, who, how. Do what you need to do, you know, carry the test of change. Study, compare your data to what you had predicted and then you act. Okay, defining the aim. See, aims should be very smart. They should be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. And it, you have a population, you have a goal, and you have time. So these three are a must for any aim statement. So we aim to, what are you aiming to do? Decrease, um, you know, for example, it could be wait times or increase whatever you're trying to increase the percentage of, you know, for us, it was, uh, uh, specimens that were uh, uh, adequate by molecular testing uh, for molecular testing, which we had collected with rapid on-site evaluation. We're increasing it from 70% to 90%. Sometimes you may not have this 70%, your baseline you may not have. For me, my clinician said, you know, your baselines, only 50% of your cases are being adequate. So for me, I used that. But the goal was to increase it to 90%. That's where we wanted to end. Um, by what time, you know? June 2019, 21, you know, whatever time you may choose. So, uh, and then have a start and a stop for your process. When will your process start and when will your process end? And that way you really want to eliminate waste because you don't want the patient coming back, you know, for another collection process. Um, so, Measurement. Now, we all do, we all, you know, pretty much in academia, you do some sort of a research project, right? So the thing with improvement, quality improvement is you have to have change, but the change may not actually be an improvement. And the kind of measurements we use for research and the kind of measurements we use for QI are going to be slightly different. Here, the purpose is to discover new knowledge for research. And you use this big blind test and you control for as many biases as you can. And you just in case you need this data, you collect everything and more. And you, you, know, you really want to get a big lump sum of data here. Unlike QI, where you really want to look at small tests of significant change, you really don't need that much data. You need just enough data to learn and go on to the next, you know, have I learned? Does this work to go on to the next cycle? You stabilize for bias. You don't control for any biases. You, your biases is going to be a part of your, um, you know, your, uh, your process. 
you make many sequential uh, uh, observable tests. So here, enumerative statistics, which is our traditional research, is looking at a static or a fixed population. You want to use random samples. Uh, you want to, you know, basically looking at, um, you're estimating characteristics for a specific patient population, right? And the focus is on the state of something at a particular point in time. And the goal is to take action on that population. While analytic statistics is a very active process, it's judgment sampling. You're trying to predict future performance of that system. And the goal is to take action on the underlying causal system. So enumerative statistics is what can I say uh, about this specific group X? Analytic statistics ask the question, what can I say about the process that produced the result in this group of X? So the two are different. So basically from a static, you're moving to a dynamic view. And dynamic because on your X axis, you're always going to have time. And on your Y axis, you're going to have your measure. And you're going to see some sort of variability in your system. Now, Schuhart actually came up with, um, uh, you know, uh, statistical process control. And he actually initially defined this kind of variability. Most of the time, it's going to be called common cause variability, right? So if you have the mean in the center, is your center line, and you have the top and as the upper control limit, which is three um, standard deviations plus the mean, and below is the lower control limit. Most of your uh, most of your measurements are going to fall between the upper and lower control limits, and they're not going to be one line. They're going to be up and down, and that is common cause uh, variability, and that is a good thing. You know, depending if you want it, because you can make changes. You know, to change your common cause variability to go up or go down. Now, sometimes what happens is you have variability that is so unpredictable that is called assignable cause or special cause variability. Now, that goes way beyond your upper control limits or your lower control limits. So that is what you want to avoid. So regardless of which process you choose, the whole idea in quality improvement is to have, you know, be within this statistical process control. Now, how do you know? You oh, you have to measure to know that your change is an improvement, right? And you really don't want to use your measurement as, you know, rear view mirror. You want to look through the windscreen and use it to look forward, not to evaluate or judge. Now, there are two major measurements. One is the conceptual definition, and the other one is the operational definition. Conceptual definition is a brief statement about what is it that you want to do. And the operational definition actually gets into the nitty gritty and gives you very detailed um, uh, idea about what, how, and so on that's going to be measured. Like here's an example, you know, operationally, you're asking what is the phenomenon, what aspect will you measure, and how will you know that the, the important one is how will you know that the measure reflects the phenomenon faithfully? So you've got to be a little careful with measures. But, you know, honestly, measures in QI is a topic by itself. So I, I'm just trying to put as much as I can here, but it's it's truly a detailed area. We can talk about it at another time, if uh, the chance, if I get the chance to do that. So think of operational operational definitions. You know, you want a clean room. Now think of a clean room, which could be a teenager's bedroom. Are you talking about the presidential suite at the Ritz Carlton, or are you talking about a clean operating room in the hospital? I'd be thrilled if there's no towels on the floor, you know, in a teenager's bedroom. You know, I'm just giving you some examples as to, um, uh, you know, how this could vary depending on what uh, your uh, base might be. Now, when you're looking to collect data, you really need to have what is the purpose of collecting this data? How will you analyze this data? How much data to collect? When do you start? When do you stop? Who will collect the data? Where will you store that data? All this needs to be thought about before you jump into a QI project. So like I mentioned, you really are measuring over time. So here's your measure. You know, for us, it was uh, percentage of cases that were adequate, you know, as opposed to inadequate over, I think we did it over six weeks. So we looked at a proportion and number of cases adequate for molecular testing divided by the total number of cases tested. 
we did one PDSA cycle. We found that we really were not getting anywhere. So we did another PDSA cycle. So the first PDSA, the first change we made was one of the uh, pathologists in the group said, you know what, before we used to put all our, you know, so we used to do touch imprint of needle core biopsies in the CT suites, and we used to do uh, a classic FNA in the bronchoscopy suite. And, you know, we used to have one, um, one cell block, you know, even if the radiologist gave me six cores, it would all be one cell block because we're not trying to, you know, look at ba background lung. We're really trying to enrich the cancer, right? So we, we, that's what we did. So we said, oh, fine, maybe we'll just put everything in one block and see how that goes. Didn't change. Uh, in fact, it became worse. So the other thing that we did for the second PDSA cycle was we cut up front, you know, so we cut 20 slides up front because all our cases were going for molecular testing. The first uh, 13 slides were for molecular studies. Uh, 14 onward were for the pathologist to, you know, do immunos and whatever else we may need. And that actually made a huge impact in terms of our adequacy rates. So after we made change two, our adequacy rates really shot up, uh, both for CT-guided needle core biopsies as well as for um, uh, molecular testing uh, by, uh, you know, for, for these samples collected by uh, bronchoscopy FNAs. So um, before we... Uh, um, uh, it's just a couple of other things that I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, what changes can we make that will result in an improvement? Um, you have to understand the forces that are holding the unchanged present. Um, there could, for, because for every problem, you're going to see cause, the potential causes, you're going to see facilitators and barriers. Thankfully for our project, it was a fairly smooth, uh, it was fairly smooth sailing. We really didn't see major barriers but for you know for generally for qi projects you are going to see some sort of barriers because what you see is only the tip of the iceberg which is the symptom and most of the causes which cause that symptom are hidden way below so um some of the things that really help you uh, help uh, help you during a qi project is for example a cause and effect diagram it really is a beautiful visual which uh, you know, makes you understand, makes everybody understand why we have a certain outcome, uh, current outcome, and what we can change. What is it that we can do to change? So the fishbone diagram is also called the Ishikawa diagram, um, and it's basically a fishbone, you know, spine with attached, uh, you know, sides, uh, side uh, bones. And this is what your process is currently, not what your future state may be, but what you're seeing right now. And on the side bones, you put these, you know, headings, machine, materials, methods, measurements, man, you know, now it's people, whatever, you know, could that could potentially be a cause for this particular outcome. This is from, you know, this is from another, another paper. This was looking at long test results time. This was way before the electronic system went into place, and there were just so many things. You know, clocks were inaccurate. Um, people had to walk the uh, specimen vials, so on and so forth. This is for our ours, you know, where the specimen was inadequate. There are so many factors. You know, the size of the nodule that was being biopsied was 0.8 centimeters and above. I mean, think about that. That's less than a centimeter. Um, patient factors. Some of these patients were status post therapy. The, there was necrosis, you know, predominantly. The, some of them didn't tolerate the procedure. And, you know, we had two separate, um, uh, processes, CT guided core biopsies. The other one was the FNA process. And in between, we also had change in molecular platforms from a PCR based platform when everything was, you know, we were doing really well to, uh, um, the next in sequencing platform, you know. So things like that. So this really helps you look at the whole process. It's a very nice visual, which really helped us figure out what we should focus on and what we can do to make a change. The other thing to do is map the process. So uh, there are, you know, the, the easiest thing to do is a flow chart. Okay. So there are many types of process uh, mapping tools available, but the easiest one is a flow chart. This symbol oval is for start or stop. This is where an action, the rectangle is where an action is happening. The diamond is a yes or no question. 
The D is there's something that's causing a delay in the process. Error is the direction in which it's going. Uh, the circle connects to something else. And the cloud is, I don't know what's happening. I need more information kind of a deal. So this is the clinician's version of the site of process map. I see my patient, I do the biopsy, or I send the patient to IR, IR does the biopsy, something happens and I find the result. You know, that's pretty much what they need, right? But that's, uh, this is, this is just a 30,000 view, uh, feet of view of uh, the process mapping. You know, we, when we did this, we realized that there were so many things, you know, that, were happening like immunos needed to be ordered on these cases. Now immunos, some people ordered two immunos, some people ordered 10 immunos, you know, and that's going to cut down how much material is left in the block. Then the case gets verified. The other question was who is supposed to order the molecular test? It's not, it was not a reflex test. So should I order it? Should I wait for the clinician? Like there were so many areas that we found that we really didn't have a good handle on and we needed more answers. So, um, just by looking at this, and, and this is just a 30,000 foot feet view, and we did a more, much more detailed process mapping where we actually followed uh, every step of the process, right from the FNA pager going out, uh, going, uh, going off, the specimen collection, how it was brought into the lab, how it was processed in the lab. Every bit of it was actually looked at and analyzed. So. Um, the most important thing with process mapping is you really want to say what is going to be your start point and what is going to be your end point. And, uh, and this really helps you look at the whole process to give you an idea of what is it that you can change. And it also, you know, you can also see some complexities in the whole process, you know, and the inconsistencies and inefficiencies when you actually do a process map. So we found that it's, you know, maybe not worthwhile getting 20 immunos, you know, maybe just two will do. And this is, I, I'm just being facetious here, but um, we found that there were a lot of inconsistencies and which were easy fixes. So um, how, you know, what changes should we make? So after we got data with the second PDSA cycle, we decided that we will use that process where we, for every lung cancer case, we initially cut 20 slides, first first 13 for something, for molecular testing, the rest uh, for um, diagnostic work. Uh, and we found that, you know, our, we actually exceeded our own expectations and more than 90% of our cases were actually adequate for molecular testing. So whenever you're doing anything that is change. Remember, you have to have a management system. Now, for us, it meant communication, communication with histology, communication among the pathologists, um, a communication with the molecular lab, you know, so and don't assume that this is all going to happen. It doesn't. You have to make it happen. And there's also going to be resistance, you know, uh, you have to use some psychology, not just for this project, but generally when you're trying to make any changes. Um, information and education are very important and it's very helpful to have me measurement, you know, some basic baseline data measurement. Um, and it's also nice when you get buy-in from everybody because that's super helpful. The other thing is publicize your results and celebrate your successes. Um, but there are going to be barriers to change because there's always going to be, you know, we've done it this way. This is not my job. We're too busy. I don't have any funds. QI generally doesn't need too much in terms of funding for these kind of small projects. Um, and But there are lots of challenges when it comes to QI also because um, you really need your uh, uh, workers, you know, your frontline people to be a part of your team. And that means if you're taking somebody else out, uh, someone else has to cover. So that's time and uh, your administrators have to get in, you know, you have to get buy-in from them. And data management is always, you know, going to be a bit of an issue. Um, and also, how do you get the data from EMS? Um, that could be a potential is a potential issue. Um, so there are some barriers to change. Um, there's also organizational cultures, um, a culture which is um, we, we, which could result in barriers. There are people who are just going to actively resist. Nah, I'm not going to do this. 
they're going to be organizational constipators. I'll take this, I'll take this, but nothing ever happens. You know, they just hold on to it, but no output. And, you know, some, some places may just have culture of mediocrity. So you you there are going to be uh, barriers anytime you want to bring in change. Um, but the important thing to remember is sequential PDSA cycles so that you build learning so that your whole system stays within statistical process control. We actually published this um, uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, we it really was super helpful to have a simple QI project, which uh, was so impactful in terms of uh, getting adequate material for molecular testing. Um, so the whole idea with PDSA is to learn, uh, continuously learn from failure um, to see what works. Um, that's all I have. Happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much. This was a fabulous overview of uh, quality improvement. And I was just uh, listening to you in awe to, uh, and trying to come up with some ideas about what to improve in our lab. But uh, before I go any further, let me uh, uh, tell the uh, audience that if they have any questions, they can write it under the questions tab and uh, send it. And I could actually read it out loud too. Uh, meanwhile, I'm also checking in on the uh, YouTube website. So if you're actually listening on the YouTube website, you can put it as a uh, uh, comment over there as well. And uh, I'd be happy to re read it from there too. Um, and so with that, um, let me start by asking some of my own questions. Um, so quality is definitely important. And one of the things you alluded to is just a very nice example you had about the uh, the molecular issues that you know you need to send it for molecular testing and you didn't have enough and that sort of thing. That seems like it's a very important issue that uh, you know happens to us cytopathologists quite a bit. Uh, but sometimes I feel like quality is done for just quality's sake, kind of like art for art's sake. Um, and that you know there's no end result. Now what are some um, take-home points that you would want to tell people in terms of quality, um, how to make it the, you know, the smart goals, how to make it measurable, and not just for the sake of, you know, doing a quality uh, project. Well, it always helps, you know, the, the, the one useful thing is to see, talk to your frontline workers because they are the guys who really know what is happening and and they can actually come up with ideas, you know, to help you with your quality project. The other thing is listen to your voice of your customer, listen to your clinicians, listen to your residents or your fellows when, because these guys really have good ideas, you know, which can be used as test of change. You know, you could be, uh, you know, could do quick quality projects with, because of some of the ideas that your residents might have or your fellows might have or your frontline workers might have, you know, if I do this differently, I might get this result, but you'll have to test it. Now, quality improvement, it's a constant process. It's not a one-time deal, unfortunately, but that's what it sometimes does seem like, you know, that it's, you're done with this project and you move on, but it's good to have somebody who, to whom it matters more. Like for me, as medical director, it's going to matter a lot to have this QI project done because then I'm going to constantly monitor it. I'm going to build upon it. You know what I mean? So my mm -hmm. resident may have done the project and moved on to something else, but I own that project now and I'm going to work on it to the next level. You know, I might make another change, you know. Um, so don't give up on it. That's what I'm trying to say. And <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, there's a couple of questions from uh, uh, the audience. One of them is actually specifically asking you about, uh, do you process small biopsies of cytology specimens? And this is an important thing. And the follow-up for that is small biopsies for molecular testing is becoming a big issue. How do you treat small biopsies in your system? So uh, that's a very good question, actually, because a lot of places are, you know, struggling with the same issue. Now, many, if it's a really thin, skinny core biopsies, 
many places process it at, as a cell block, mainly for cancer because or for molecular testing, because you really want to enrich your DNA, basically, right? So a lot of places, you know, regardless of where I've worked, uh, at Dartmouth, we always processed our small biopsies um, more like cell blocks because they were such skinny, thin needle core biopsies, you know, 22 gauge needle core biopsy is what we were getting. And a lot of places do process these as cell blocks. Some places still process them as, you know, traditional histology slides. But uh, there is um, there is more and more, you know, uh, we, we, we do that even here sometimes, you know, some of our cases do get processed as a cell block. Because you really want to keep it together. And, you, you know, you don't want them floating off, frankly, you know, and they're just mm -hmm. such diddly little bits of tissue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is important. And you actually have a paper on this, uh, you know, recommending putting maybe the small biopsies, skinny or core biopsies uh, and reporting them together with the cytology if you have it. Yeah, there's a white paper that came out a while ago, I think, and, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. recommending it. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, here's another question. And this is a good Atelia of uh, quality. How are the errors conveyed to the person um, and if someone's particularly error prone, how do you handle this? Okay, so now I'm assuming that you're talking about the pathologist, right? So many places now have an ongoing professional evaluation. For us, we actually look at um, category three, we call it category three errors. So error is not, you know, it depends on how significant that error was and, you know, what led to it. Now, if there is a major diagnostic discrepancy, you know, sometimes it's going to happen. You think it's X on this day, you show it to an expert after you sign it out, but then, you know, something is niggling at the back of your mind or you get, you, you know, you get feedback from the clinician and you look at it again and you say, oh, this could be this and you change your diagnosis. Now that's, you know, that's a serious change in amended report. Now, just because somebody has made an error doesn't mean that is a bad thing by itself. You need to monitor that. And we have a written policy for how you're going to monitor that error. If that person is consistently making an error, you know, then you need to have some sort of a way to A, pick out those errors. B, what are you going to do about that? Are you going to send that person for additional retraining? You know, there has to be some sort of a written policy about what you're going to do. You know, are they going to be sent, you know, for, you know, who, I don't know, you know, for a not full fellowship or something like that, but for some sort of uh, additional coaching? Uh, is somebody else going to look at their slides for a while till, you know, you feel comfortable that this person can be left uh, on their own? So there has to be a policy on monitoring these errors. They're going to be some sort of, you know, I'm talking about major, major errors, not minor errors, you know, like there's a spelling mistake or, you know, that you, it's not ideal. You don't want that to happen, but, you know, stuff like that is going to be, is going to happen some in, in every lab. You really are looking at major errors. Have a policy, stick to that policy, have an ongoing, you know, professional evaluation policy both for anybody new you take on in your institution and for all the faculty who are working there and mm -hmm. how you're going to handle that. How many errors will you allow? Will you allow three errors? Will you allow five errors? Are you going to do it as a percentage? Think about that and come up with a policy. We have ours and I'm happy to talk about it. Um, you know, just email me and I'm happy to talk about it. That's very good. Thank you. Thank you. So here's another uh, question. You know, which one is better way, like the uh, the stick or the carrot when you're dealing with, say, um, amended reports? I mean, to me, I don't believe uh, chastising someone for amended reports, especially if it's for minor things. I think it's good that you can set your ego aside and say, hey, I made this mistake and you're, you know, correcting it. Uh, but when you look at sort of the institutional level, they look at, well, how many reports has it been done? Has, has it been amended by this person? And maybe as a pathologist, uh, you get chastised. Or maybe as a cytotechnologist, you get chastised for making errors. Um, so which way do you recommend? That should there be any chastising for that? Or should it be, you know, okay, good job that you amended it, that you, you know, admitted that there was an error? I think the first thing is to 
commend somebody for admitting that there was an error because that itself is a huge deal. You know, um, I would first commend that person. Amended reports are going to happen to all of us. You know, we work in such high volume environment. You are eventually going to happen. You're eventually going to have to amend a report. The only thing is you don't want to make a habit of it. You know, once in a way, if you amend a report, it's going to happen to every person who's working, you know, every person who's signing out. I don't think I've met one person who's never had to amend a report. You know, um, I would not use the stick. I think we've, we, we really need to move away from the stick philosophy, honestly, you know, because mm -hmm. it would be nice to have some sort of an error reporting system you know, like the airline pilots have, you know, where you can actually say, oh, I made this error or this happened without getting penalized for it, actually learning from it. So for mm -hmm. us, if I make an error, for me, it becomes a learning experience. You know, I want to share it with my group to say, hey, guys, this is what happened to me. You know, just make sure you don't do this next time. You know, so that's how I approach it. Mm -hmm. You know, there was changing the culture such that people are comfortable with admitting the errors and making changes. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Totally agree. Okay, there's a couple of questions. Uh, circling back to your, what is your cell block process? Uh, so currently where I am, so there are different, different processes that we've used. So, uh, you know, we pretty much spin down our specimen. And we um, sometimes use auger uh, if it's a very minute specimen, but if not, we use the whole um, whole um, pellet to make our cell block and fix it in formalin. So a lot of our specimens get collected in uh, normal saline um, so that we just spin it and collect the entire specimen and use it or use auger. So there are different, uh, in fact, there's even a book that's just come out for making cell blocks. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Um, here's another question. Again, I guess circling back to your uh, original question, we, we must be all suffering with this uh, molecular uh, diagnosis. Any ideas how to make formalin fixed paraffin blocks for PDL1 on EBUS, bronchoscopy guided aspirations, or cell blocks uh, are not recommended for PDL1 testing? So, questions about PDL1 testing on these samples. We've, uh, we, we, we sort of, uh, we tried to collect everything in normal saline and make the cell block almost immediately soon after coming to the lab. That way we are, you know, not losing time. Uh, and so far, I don't think we've had any issues with our PDL1 testing or any of our other molecular testing. And we've been using formalin fixed paraffin embedded slides, uh, 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 paraffin embedded material for our molecular testing. Including PDL one, uh, PDL one. I'm not. I, as far as I know, yes. But I'll have to double check on that. I'll have to check with my lab about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Occasionally, we've sent out for PDL one too. It, it just is a little bit difficult to interpret sometimes. Right. Um, I'll have to double check the current, you know, process right now for PDL one. Okay. So here's another question from another participant. Um, what is your recommendation for overcoming a culture of mediocrity? Ooh, loaded question. Loaded. Yeah, a and good question. question. <laughs> it's a good question. It's a tough question. Um, I would use measurement. You know, I would consistently use data um, uh, because that really has some value, you know, more than anything else, more than words or more than trying to talk to people. Use data, you know, and show that this is, Make it data driven, basically, um, and and also try and see how how other institutions are doing things, so that you know you could potentially move your group towards a more data driven and um, uh, you know quality uh, focus away from you know this is how we've done it, this is how we will do it. Uh, background. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So along those lines, um, you know, we're by clear regulations, we are mandated to collect all our uh, laboratory information, including our ATP rates, and that is a good benchmark. Uh, but sometimes it's difficult to monitor and uh, perhaps uh, impress on everyone saying, or your ATP rate should be under 10%, because 
if you uh, push someone to the corner and say, okay, your ATP rate is too high, it needs to be lower, then are there going to be some erroneous diagnosis or are they going to be pushed into making diagnosis they don't want? And how do you handle that? So every measure you have has to have has to be a balanced measure. For example, if you're pushing somebody to reduce their ATP rate, something else is probably going to go up. You're mm -hmm. right. So it's not just that person reducing their ATP rate. It is what can you do to reduce, help them reduce their ATP rate. One thing we we found useful was to have uh, a multi-head meeting, you know, so that Dr. X's ATP rate comes down, you know. So we all agreed that this would not be called atypical. This would be either called negative or would be called positive or suspicious. And that actually helped, you know, so that our, that Dr. X's ATP rate dropped, our lab ATP rate dropped, and it was quite useful, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to do that. Because there are something called balancing measures. One thing goes down, something else is going to go up. Something else is going up, exactly. Yeah. So consensus, like you say, is one of the better ways of doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, I think that is it for our questions. This was really a very nice talk and clearly you know so much about uh, quality that it's such a pleasure listening to you. Thank you so much for uh, volunteering to do this talk for us. Thanks so much, Galiz. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.